I can sit here and watch the clock now. Once the sequence number reaches the right point. Interesting, there's a, this group of people on this side today, and it's kind of light on that side, like an out of balance plane. All right, so we'll get started. Eight o'clock, good morning. Hope you're doing well. That's good. We'll start off with the usual logistics, get out of the way. Um, project 2 reports are currently being graded. They were a little harder than Project 1. Not a lot, but um, this time I've got the TAs going through and grading things, and they just aren't quite as fast as I am. You do this for a while and you begin to realize that you can look at it for about 30 seconds and have a pretty good idea. I might be exaggerating slightly, but... Uh, there was a small update to the Project 3 repo. Somebody else pointed out a dead link. I went back and checked. It's been dead since it was put into the materials a couple years ago. So I went and found some other link to randomly use for talking about um, um, strong consistency. It was for Project 5, I think. So I'm sure you're all busy working on your sharded key value store at this point. I mean, the danger here, of course, is that you get this gives you a little more flexibility to work with the other classes. But then, of course, if you do too much of that, this will become crisis mode. I'm trying to avoid that, but ultimately, you guys get to manage your own time. It's both one of the upsides and downsides of being an adult. Uh, let's see, nothing's changed on four and five due dates or. Staggered project three is due in less than two weeks. So I've seen some questions. We'll seem to be working through that. Project three is uh, significantly more effort than project two. Just fair warning. It, it's kind of an unfair ramp. You know, project one, it's like lulls you into this sense of, wow, this is really easy. Project two is like, okay, this is still pretty easy. Project three is like, okay, this is got some substance to it, and then Project 4 and 5s whack you across the head and go, ha, 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 we were just fooling with you. Um, the proposals were due on January 30th. We're reviewing them. Nothing much has really changed there. I have created private threads on Piazza. If you think that you submitted a team proposal and, or, or a proposal, a uh, team proposal, actually, um, I had one person take the... Uh, the open source software challenge. I'm actually excited about that one because it, it they, they picked a pretty interesting project to work on. Um, the, the point here is that if you are in one of those teams, you're doing one of the optional projects, then you should proceed according to plan and expect to get some feedback in the next couple of days. I have uh, office hours again this afternoon. Those are my casual office hours on Discord, so feel free to pop in, not pop in. You're always welcome to send me messages on Discord if you want. That, that's the most casual way of doing it. You can, of course, create threads on Piazza as well. Um, this class doesn't use Piazza a huge amount. Interesting. So I, I'm also shadowing the graduate version of this at Georgia Tech, and they ask a lot more questions on Piazza. Sometimes it's interesting too, they seem to be struggling a little more. They're on project two and people are struggling with it a little more than the group here did. Lots of recommended readings this time. I'm gonna be talking about these papers throughout the, the lecture. So if you want to learn more, you can go look at these papers. If you want to understand more about what's behind many of the, the diagrams that I'm going to be using, since many of them are lifted from, from these various papers, then this is a great place to go look. If your eyes roll into the back of your head when you look at an academic paper in the club, uh, that's a separate skill set. Is there anybody here who likes reading an academic paper? 
I actually don't mind it now. I've gotten pretty good at it. You basically you pick up an academic paper, you read the abstract. Am I even remotely interested in this paper at this point? No, don't read the rest of it. The abstract is their opportunity to market it to you, to convince you that it's worth, it, it's the trailer. And if the trailer sucks, you're not going to watch the movie. Same thing with an academic paper. Then you go read the intro. The intro is supposed to set the whole scene. You basically understand what the plot of the story is at that point. Is it worth pursuing? No, it's another rom-com. Not interested. Or it's a horror movie. I don't like horror movies. Or whatever. That's great. And then oftentimes that's all you need. Because the intro teaches you what the paper is supposed to actually go into great detail about. Do you care about the details? Often you don't. It's like when you go to a restaurant. Do you really want to see the recipe? Probably not. You just want to eat the food and enjoy it. So you want to get the little nugget, the takeaway. You know, somebody spends a couple of years of their lives building something in, in 30 seconds or two minutes or whatever you want to spend on it. You read that synopsis and hopefully you lift something out of it. Do you know when you go back and read the guts of the paper? When you actually want to understand what they really did. Because you want to pick up their work and do something with it. Well, the downside to these papers are they're the, the last category paper. If you actually start building your own distributed database, you're probably going to want to start reading some of these. All right, I did put one nugget in there that even people who are really good at reading dense, chewy um, academic papers have a hard time with it, and that is Leslie Lamport's The Part-Time Parliament. That one, people who work in this field and who are experts at it, they still read it and go, huh? I mean, it's so bad that he had to write a follow-on paper, which was basically Paxo simplified. There's a lot of papers here. These are, in general, four papers. Uh, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about Spanner. I've mentioned Spanner several times in the past. I talked about the, the whole atomic clock thing. We're going to talk about the interesting trick that they actually used. So I've set the stage for that previously. Now we're going to talk about it in greater detail. And then view stamp replication is actually great because Barbara Liskov, who was at MIT, actually proposed this, her lab, they actually proposed this around the same time that... that um, Lamport wrote the Paxos paper. The Paxos paper didn't get published for eight more years, which is its own little mystery story. It kind of got lost in the submission process, and Leslie just didn't care. So it's not like he said, are you guys going to finish this or anything? I think they just found it and went, oh, crap, we forgot to review this. Okay. Um, or maybe they couldn't find anybody who could read it and understand it. That is distinctly possible as well. Has anybody tried to read the part-time parliament? I have. It's, it's dense. I need to go back and read it again to see if I can actually wrap my head around it a little more. Because he's writing in this very whimsical style. I need to dig up. I've got a couple of pictures of um, uh, Axos, the actual place, which is this Greek island. And I have a picture of a clock. It's a big clock tower, building clock tower clock. And it's like, this is just like the, the summation of Lamport's work. This is a clock in Paxos. Wow. Anybody have any questions? I had the promise of a funny story, so I'm looking forward to a funny story. You can handle it. I know. Yeah, and then... So we get there, and for some reason, we need to scan tickets. And so I scan the tickets. She scans the tickets because she bought them. <laughs> and it turns out to be like a drag show. And it's, it's just like crazy. I have never like been to one. And you know, you, you don't really expect people to go that wild for drag queens, but like they, they do. And that was like pretty funny. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, Interesting. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and now you're, you've decided to become a drag queen yourself? Did you pick out a drag name? Oh. You cannot generate those? I'm not making one up for you. No, no. Those are way too personal. 
Maybe sometimes people like to actually act out fantasies or something. I don't know. But you guys are, you know, fourth year students at UBC. You probably have spent your entire time mostly focused on studies. Um, I mean, I went to the University of Chicago, and it was known as the place where fun goes to die. I mean, I kid you not. It's like, you know, a Saturday night was people studying. Let's talk about failure. I decided to reach back a little bit and say, well, I haven't picked on Amazon yet. And I said, you know, let's reach back a little bit. I, I looked at one case. It was really interesting. It's a 2002 case. And I was like, hmm. But I finally decided it wasn't bad enough. It was basically a den distributed denial of service attack on the DNS infrastructure, where somebody literally started pinging all of the DNS root servers. And what's fascinating about it is that the system didn't actually go completely dead. So I was like, that's not an interesting enough failure. This is a cool failure. This is Amazon Web Services, the S3 group. Uh, let's see, that would be just before Andy got there. Andy uh, Warfield was a professor here. He's still an adjunct faculty member. And he was, he was a, an associate professor. Um, and he's, I was working with him. And, and then... Let's see, I was working with him for nine months, then I started the PhD program, and then three weeks later he quit and went to Amazon, and he, he actually works on S3. So there's a, there's a good-sized group here in Vancouver that works on S3. But I think in the beginning of 2017, they didn't have much of a presence here, because they hired him partially to create that presence. Um, which I thought was funny, because I kind of looked at a similar role in 2014. And they said, if I wanted to go to Seattle, I could do it. And I was like, I don't want to leave Vancouver. So, didn't happen. So at the highest level, Amazon's simple storage service, S3, is just a key value store. They call it an object store, but it's basically a key value interface. Now, it's got lots of other stuff in the interface. But the fundamental operations here are put, get, and delete. Hmm. Do you recognize these? Is there maybe a reason that, that these are actually used in the projects? That's because this is fundamentally a very simple but very powerful model. And this is basically the internet model. This is the way that HTTP works. You get pages, you put forms and you know content. So you send messages back, you get answers back. And the delete thing, well, we just have to do that because occasionally people want to delete things. Go figure. Dirty secret is that we don't really actually delete very much on the internet. It's like if um, I, I, you've heard of Facebook. Um, it turns out they have a delete, delete picture function. They don't delete anything. It, turns, it was too expensive to implement delete. So what they did instead, you'll love this, they put a blacklist in the front. So when you delete a picture, they put a list in the front that says this picture has been deleted. And so when you go to retrieve the picture, it looks in the blacklist. And if it's in there, it says, oh, sorry, that picture can't be found. The picture's still there. Anybody have a phone? Anybody take pictures on their phone? Yeah, I, all right, so half the class is, is honest, and the other half of the class is going, I'm not raising my hand. It's too much work this early in the morning. That's like exercise. Can't do that. Um, how, many ta how many of you have actually gone through your pictures and, and curated them, deleted the ones that you don't want to keep? There's always a few. It's like a, a, there, there's actually a, a guy I knew who did his PhD, and one of the things he looked at was that there are people who actually do curate their, their data, their information, but it's like 10%. And I saw that roughly that kind of number, 10, 15% of the people do that. The rest of us basically just go, I don't care. It doesn't cost me anything. And so we keep it. Welcome to my research area. The problem with keeping everything is you can't find anything at some point. You know, you're still young enough. You've only collected a few years worth of data. Imagine after a few decades of this and it's scattered over dozens of different places where you've stored things and you can't find anything anymore. You know, there's really cool pictures that you took on vacation in, uh, let's see, when was that? 2000. 
I carry those around for a long time. Now I have no idea where they are, which is a shame. I had pictures from Venice looking out towards Lido that were like postcards. It was just amazing. But they're gone. Oh, well, I guess I have to go back to Venice. Not too, not too bad. There's a conference I, I'm planning on going to in May, and that'll be in Rome. So Rome, Venice, they look pretty close to each other when you're sitting in Vancouver. Amazon S3 is used for lots of things. I don't know if you've actually heard of Netflix. It's this streaming video service. They've been using Amazon Web Services for at least a decade now. Now, of course, Netflix puts a lot of stuff on top of that as well. But what Amazon provides them with is very scalable services. So if everybody decides they're going to watch some program, Amazon can scale up and deliver that program. Amazon has uh, caching, so they can move the videos closer to where people are watching them so the amount of time it takes to get across the network is lower. Reddit is all built on top of S3. And then there's this thing called Pinterest. I don't know, it was on the list and I'm going, I want to have three examples and that was the, the least crappy of the other ones. Um, I'm not a big Pinterest fan. Uh, maybe you guys are, but it's very common for people to use Amazon Web Services. People put their whole websites in S3. It does a really good job of, of providing that kind of content. It has strange consistency models, but they were debugging a problem. You're seeing a pattern here, aren't you? It's, it's when we get humans in there to start typing things and trying to fix things that we break things. It's like, oh, have you ever done that? Tried to fix something and then broken it worse than it was to begin with? And then you're going, oh, crap, what am I going to do to fix this? And you're swearing at the computer. Does anyone swear at their computer? Am I the only one? No, it's like a quarter, a third, 15% of the class. The rest of you just look at it and go, oh, you're just not well understood. Let's go to therapy together. Um, I, I just love the description. Okay, so this is 9.37 in the morning. And their report actually uses Pacific time because, of course, Amazon is primarily based out of Seattle. <laughs> Unfortunately, one of the inputs to the command was entered incorrectly, and a larger set of servers was removed than intended. Oops. That's one of those oh shit moments. <laughs> and then we get the knock-on effects, where, of course, those servers supported other servers, which then broke other things that made other metadata disappear. Oh, and by the way, we built all these other services on top of S3 because it was so reliable, and unfortunately, this took away all that reliability. So you see a lot of knock-on effects from something so fundamental. S3 is one of the earliest services that Amazon actually stood up, like 2006, 2007, that time frame. Very, very early on. It... These are the people now who worry about uh, data measured in exabytes at this stage. You, you know what an exabyte is, right? 1,024 petabytes. And a petabyte is 1,024 terabytes. Do you know what comes after exabyte? Well, there's an ISO committee on absurdly large numbers that, that fixes these things for us. So, in fact, the next number is a zettabyte. We generate several zettabytes of data globally as an entire community, we generate several zettabytes of data every year. And that number doubles about every 18 months. So the rate at which our data continues to increase. Because storage people have made it so cheap, we don't have to delete anything. Great for my research. Big impact from this, oh my god. Oh, this is awful. Um, EC2 went down, electric, uh, elastic block store went down, uh, if you needed an S3 snapshot, which of course you would need. Even AWS Lambda, which was fairly new at that point. This is uh, serverless operations, where you just run little chunks of code, basically, uh, inside of Amazon Web Services. I see a number of heads bobbing, so people know. The service was full, fully restored at 154. 
So they had a total power, power outage, total outage time of just over four hours. Well, sort of, but then of course there were these other services that didn't recover once the underlying S3 service recovered, so it took even longer. So in fact, these things do take hours and sometimes days to resolve. One of the best things though, is that the knock-on was, by the way, we couldn't tell people that there was an outage because it relied on S3. Our console that told people what services were doing what relied on the service that was down. So we used Twitter. Uh, Twitter doesn't actually use AWS. Well, it may use AWS, but it didn't use it on anything that's critical. Again, what are the takeaways here? Manual inter interventions are always high risk procedures. This is why we automate things. This is why we, we have to think about these things and we still screw up. And, and that's the other important thing to take away from this is we have to deal with failure. I'm gonna hammer on that theme through the rest of this class. This is about handling failure. You've taken lots of classes here. How many of your classes have actually focused on what you do when things go bad? Usually you just kind of skip that. Ah, well, that's an exception, that's an outlier. We have to make the outliers our common case. But we have to do it in a way that we don't spend too many resources doing it. And that's gonna be a big part of the discussion today. I think the equally important takeaway from all of these failure cases where companies say, this is what went wrong, is you need to have these cultures in which you understand failure is a norm. People screw up, systems break, hardware goes bad. What's bad is if you don't address the problem and you don't learn from it. Because if you don't learn from it, you're gonna keep repeating that problem. We always strive to try and take away something useful so that next time the problem doesn't happen. And it's really cool when you read the whole blog post where they talked about things that they had designed to handle some of these failures and they didn't perform as well as they thought. And so what they were going to do to try and address that in the next iteration. This is really hard to test. How do you test this kind of failure? This is a real problem in distributed systems. Once they get large enough, no one has a test infrastructure for it. So you test in deployment, which is really scary. Do you really want to be the, the, the person who's been there six months that makes you know, Amazon Web Services go down for four hours and 14 minutes? You literally are going to come in and go, I'm getting fired. Um, I, there's a story I read one time about a, a, an engineer who blew up like some $100,000 piece of test equipment by doing something wrong and is expecting to get fired. And the boss goes, fire you? I just spent $100,000 training you. You don't make those kinds of mistakes a second time. If you do, then you probably will get fired. Always strive to do that. And this is just advice. This isn't actually anything that you need to know about this class, but always strive to do that. When you're working in distributed systems, in any kind of endeavor like this, expect that things are gonna go wrong, encourage people to own up to it, and figure out how to prevent it from happening in the future. So what are we gonna be talking about today? We're gonna to talk about distributed transactions. How hard could this possibly be? Well, I have mentioned before there is this interesting challenge around consistency. We had a very formal definition of consistent cuts. I have since used that to explain why that gives us consistency. But of course, we're going to be building systems that are larger than anything we can formally verify. So we need to be able to reason about this. We need to find ways where we can come up with small consistencies and then build up big consistencies from small consistencies. We're gonna talk about some ways of implementing distributed transactions. These are largely derived from the database community. The database community started doing two-phase commit in the 70s. It's hard to even find an actual paper to point to. Usually what I end up finding is a textbook from the 70s that talks about two-phase commit. 
I mean, it, it was a big deal. The dis database community relies on getting these details correct. And we know how to build two-phase commit. One of the parts of two-phase commit is we have to be able to serialize things. So we have something called two-phase locking. Um, interestingly enough, the approach that I ended up using in the first transactional system I built uh, was different. We actually, instead of using locking, we used merging. And I haven't seen anybody really talk much about that. But you, instead of keeping uh, transactions isolated and blocking one transaction from, from proceeding when another one has already touched that data, we would merge them together and let them conti continue together, but then they had to commit together. You basically tied their commit together. I'm not convinced it was the best solution, but it was the solution we chose at the time. We're going to talk about true time. I should have put a capital T on the second time, a T in time. Uh, that is the name that Google gave to their approach in Spanner. And it's an interesting observation about what we can do when we actually have a global clock. We're going to talk about Google Spanner, AWS Aurora, and Cockroach DB, each of which provide generally these kinds of guarantees, but with different consistency models. Before I get into this, I want to just simply review what a transaction is. Is there anyone in here who's heard of a transaction before? How many of you have what you think is a good understanding of a transaction? Yeah, and that's why I put the slide in here, because I said, you know, it's way too easy. I see too many discussions where people just automatically go, oh, well, you, of course, know what a transaction is. You're like, eh, sort of. And then I end up using this stupid ATM example, where you go to the ATM, you put your card in, you put your pin in, you ask for money, it gives you money, hopefully. Um, and you're done. There's lots of distinct steps there, each of which can fail. But you want either nothing happened, or the money is in your hand, and it came out of your account. And that's a dumb but very common example of a transaction. There are lots of places where things can fail. If something fails between the time that you put your card in and the time you get your money, we need to go back to the way the world was before you put your card in, or at the moment you put your card in. If you don't have money in your account, we don't take anything out. We don't give you any cash. We just laugh at you and give you your card back. Or maybe we're really cruel and we keep your card. So it's not perfect in that instance. But as far as the bank is concerned, life's good. We got your card too now. So. What we do at the beginning of a transaction is we start in a consistent state. Oh, and it's durable, which means that it's been recorded someplace. So we know what the state of the world is. And even if the power were to go away and we were to power back up, we'd still be able to see what the state was. So it's durable in that sense. It's recorded on like a disk or... Um, what else could you do besides disks? You could do paper tape. Probably never even seen a paper tape. When I was a kid, my mom worked for somebody who did, uh, they had a teletype machine, and you actually encoded the messages on paper tape and then fed it, fed it into this teletype machine, which sent a, mess, a signal to a satellite relay. They were, uh, he was an importer, exporter for power equipment, like big generators, diesel generators, like, you know, things that you buy for cities, kind of generators. Crazy stuff. But paper tape was around, it still is around. I'm sure there's still somebody using it, just like there's people who still use fax machines. OK, so we start. It's durable. It's consistent. Now we do something that changes the state of the world. We do a write. Now we get into our key value store. You know, we're reading and writing data, but we're processing put and get operations. So I, I wanted to show that you know, the, the high level operations that we're performing are being translated into low-level modifications, or uh, you know, read, modify, write kinds of cycles. And we can have multiples of those steps. There are only two exits out of this. Either we abort, at which point we go back to where we started. Nothing happened. Pay no attention. Nothing happened. We are back where we were. Or. Everything worked, 
and we are now at a new durable consistent state. That's the basic point of a transaction. It gets us from point A to point B with a lot of fuzz in the middle so that we don't care what that fuzz is as an outside observer. Who cares about that fuzz? The person implementing the transactional system. You're in a distributed systems class. Guess who the person implementing that transactional system is? Hi. Look in the mirror. It's you. This is why you have to understand this. When you start talking to a database, you're building your shopping cart application because what else do you have to do on a Saturday night, right? You're building your shopping cart application for your, your, your I don't know, web commerce package that you've decided to build for whatever reason. Okay, so you take something out of inventory. Somebody puts it in their cart, so you take it out of inventory. But they haven't bought it yet. So you don't want to commit that yet. So you keep the transaction open until they finally push the little button that says, okay, charge my credit card. And then you go and you charge their credit card. And you see things that might go wrong here. Oh, yeah. Lots of things that might go wrong. Like maybe the credit card gets declined. Well, we put it back in the cart. We don't commit the transaction. But your credit card actually gets authorized. And now we commit the transaction. Because now that thing really is out of inventory. Now, there's... I'm hand-waving this because there's lots and lots of steps. Um, I have a friend who finished his CS degree from Waterloo two years ago. And mostly his job now is watching these kinds of queues where people order stuff online for a company that does custom printing. Order, orders the stuff online, and then it gets put into other queues so it gets processed because it has to be sent to somebody to actually produce the stuff. So there's a higher level of transaction going on here, right? Not just that low-level transaction. And we frequently see this in transactional systems, that we frequently end up nesting transactions. We're not even going to start producing your order until your credit card's been charged. But we're not really done with the order just because we've got your money. Now we have to get somebody to actually create the thing because this is a custom printing, right? So we have to send it to the right printing house. That means they have to have the right materials. When things go haywire, they get queued up. And someone has to go in and manually fix that, figure out what's going on, restart jobs. There's a lot of those kinds of jobs out there. It's a lot of what distributed systems people end up doing at the beginning is they end up working with these kinds of complex distributed systems and, and shepherding them and trying to figure out ways of automating things and making it less and less manual over time. All based on the transaction. Okay, so now let's branch out. Ah, okay. One more slide on transactions. Uh, there's this thing called ACID. The ACID properties are a transaction is atomic. It either entirely happens or it doesn't happen at all. It is consistent at the beginning and the end. It doesn't have to be consistent in the middle. That's the whole point of the transaction. We know there may be inconsistent states. We have to build the infrastructure to make sure that if things go wrong when we're in an inconsistent state, that we can get back to a consistent state. It's isolated. No one outside of us can see the inconsistencies. Other transactions cannot see those inconsistencies. They have a consistent view. This simplifies the way that you think about building applications. So the primary reason we do this is that it makes everybody else's lives a lot easier. The downside to this is it makes our life a little more challenging. All right, a lot more challenging, but you guys like challenge. And then durable, which means that the outcome isn't going to roll backwards. Oh, I changed my mind. Yeah, I know I charge a credit card, and, but you know I, I'm not going to actually put that order into the system. So you're not going to get your custom printed t-shirt. Now let's make it a little more fun. Instead of just simply doing this on a single computer, like with one database, let's make it two databases. Now we have to coordinate state changes across different pieces. How much harder could this possibly be? 
it's kind of like when, and I've used this stupid example before, you need to, you're going to go out with a group of friends to have food. If it's just you deciding where to go get something to eat, it's easy. The moment you start adding other people into the mix, it's way harder. And you'll notice as the size of the group grows, the amount of time it takes to reach consensus grows. Same problem, exact same problem. So the idea is the same. We're all going to agree on where to go to dinner. But the effort required increases. Our job is going to be to try and find clever ways of keeping that cost as low as possible, trying to do it efficiently, and still providing this kind of consistency guarantee and durability and isolation and atomicity. The more communications we have here, the slower this is going to be. Remember I talked about the cost of moving data? Even small pieces of data have a certain cost associated with them. It's a time cost. One of the, the uh, pretty much constant observations about the internet is that the bandwidth of the internet has pretty much been uh, less than the bandwidth of a van full of um, storage devices for like three decades. Doesn't make any difference. You just pick a, t a moment in time. You take the, the best storage device that you can get, the most dense storage device you can get. You fill it up with data. You put it in your van. You drive it from one end of the continent to the other end of the continent. And the bandwidth is higher than you can get through the internet. What's the problem? Yeah, latency's killer. And it's crazy because when you go buy internet service, they sell you bandwidth. But if you're gaming, what do you care about? Latency. I'm not sending big ass packets. I'm sending lots of little ass packets. I want them to get there really fast. So, you know, the people who are offering you the quantum network that only gets, you know, I don't know, two megabits a second might end up giving you better service than the one that gives you gigabit per second connectivity, but it takes 100 milliseconds for your packets to get from point A to point B. If you're not sending 100 gigabits a second, bandwidth doesn't do you any good. Latency thing is the thing that, that kills you here. And that's very much true here. As we begin increasing our coordination between the actors in our system, that latency is going to get us. Of course, we also have multiple people trying to access the same databases. This is going to play into our transactional system. A transactional system where there's one client and one server, boring. You don't really need to do a whole lot of serialization in that one. A system where we have n clients in one server, a little more interesting. Gee, I've just gone through projects one and two, haven't I? Huh. Let's make it more interesting. Let's do multiple clients and multiple servers. Well, we'll do baby steps. Let's do two servers, a primary and a backup. The primary and the backup now, notice we've actually started putting a a, a distributed database in there using snapshots. OK, that works. So now we've got n clients and two servers. We're, we're, we're getting there. This is, then we're going to just simply dump three servers. And once we go to three, we might as well go to infinity and beyond, because now it's hard. Yeah, that's the problem with this jump. That's why project three to project four is this huge kind of jump where, oh my gosh, I've gone from two servers, which was hard to reason about, to three servers, where you go, wow, this problem didn't get 50% harder. It got nine times harder. So the simplest way for us to implement distributed transactions and really the basis of the way we always do this, is we end up with what we call a coordinator. The reason that your single database system is easy to implement is that your coordinator is your database. The database gets to decide what the outcome of a given transaction is. The moment I have two agents that are involved here, two databases, a key value store and um, a SQL database, which is not an uncommon kind of mix to see people use. Now I need something to play. In project three, we introduced a view server to help us play. 
I'm not sure if anybody has really picked up. I think oh, I've already yammered about this, so somebody hopefully has picked up on it. Either that, you just read what I wrote and your eyes glazed over and you went, WTF is he talking about? You can't do a consensus protocol with two agents. Uh, you can, but that means that you end up with a primary and a backup. You can do that. The reason we introduced a view server into project three is because how do we pick the primary? It's really the only thing the view server does there. It says, I get to pick the primary. Odd numbers allow you to always have a way of getting a quorum. And we're going to be talking about quorum a lot. We're going to talk about quorum a little bit again today, but we're going to keep talking about quorum. Because reaching a quorum means now we have the ability to reason about something. We can't get two winning votes if we have a system that enables quorum. Right? If you've got three people voting and each vote carries the same weight, you, get, you can't get two and two. You can never get a tie in that situation. The view server is a tiebreaker in the primary backup model. We're going to use the same approach in a more general fashion. We have a coordinator. The coordinator is the decision maker. Honestly, when you start looking at the other protocols, it's how we pick the decision maker that is usually the thing that changes. When we look at blockchain, we will actually see a much more pure quorum model. Where there isn't really a leader, it really is a consensus. Once enough nodes, 50.00001%, have agreed that something's happened, we're done. First past the post, we're done. We now have a guaranteed agreement. Well, except for that 60 minute window when the world could change, but I'll leave that for a future lecture when you're going to be all excited about blockchain, because that's a buzzword, right? How many own Bitcoin? Ethereum? Doggy coin? Monero? Probably sitting at home using your using UBC's electricity to generate Monero, right? Got to pay the bills somehow. Seriously, nobody's traded cryptocurrency in here? Or are you just afraid to admit it? I've traded cryptocurrency. I got out of it because I said, this doesn't make any sense to me at all. Not from a technology perspective, but from an economics perspective. It's like, what's the utility? The Canadian dollar has utility because you can pay your taxes with it. That's why governments issuing currency, the currency actually has a value, is that the government gives it inherent value. And then we agree to use that value when we exchange things with each other. We'll get there. The coordinator is the one that tells us what the outcome of a given transaction was. It's the one that coordinates between the players in our distributed transactional system. Our nodes have some sort of state, mutable state, so things can change. I mean, if the node only maintains immutable state, you can include it, but it's not terribly interesting because you don't really get me. It, it, the state of the immutable objects don't change from one end of the transaction to the other. So there's never any inconsistent point within that. It's only mutable state that creates inconsistent points. So that's not bad, because that's going to make our jobs a lot easier. I might have a billion things in my database, but I'm not going to manipulate a billion things in every transaction. I'm going to manipulate six. A very small number. And that's why this is going to work OK. Assuming we don't do a global snapshot of it on the end of every transaction. Our coordinator becomes a leader. We may have an election protocol. We may have an appointed leader. In project three, we appointed a leader. We called it the, the view server. Uh, you may notice that the view server is, in fact, a single point of failure in that system. This is not a great design. But before you learn how to do great design, let's do an OK design. The nodes themselves 
can be involved in a subset of the transactions. So if I have a dozen databases, maybe I only need to talk to three for this transaction. The coordinator needs to be involved in all of the transactions for any of the databases that could be involved in a transaction that coordinator coordinates for. Kind of makes sense, right? I can't coordinate something I don't have any way of, of uh, communicating with. So if that becomes part of a transaction, I need a, a, an Uber coordinator that coordinates things. Let's talk about Spanner, because Spanner is, in fact, Google's implementation of um, a distributed object store. And they use it for everything. It's still in use today. I'm sure it doesn't look like it did at the time they wrote that paper. Probably didn't look like um, it did at the time they, they uh, presented that paper. They probably already evolved beyond what they had written in the paper. It takes about a year to get a paper done and accepted and presented and out in the general public. And that's been many years now. So Spanner is a global data store. It is geo-replicated. We have multiple copies of things, both in the data center and then across data centers. Why would we do it across data centers? What's our threat there? What kind of failure are we concerned about? I don't know, a hurricane. Hurricane comes in, rips all of the data center up, blows it away. Oops, all the data's gone. And you laugh, but these things have happened. They actually have lost data centers. Not a lot. Fires. Disasters. Yeah, sabotage. Um, errant missiles. I mean, the Russians don't seem to be very good at targeting these things. So they, they probably tried to get the daycare center sitting on the top. We do sharding because sharding is a technique that allows us to provide, it's kind of like crack was, where we spread some of the read load out across multiple different servers, but then we also get the benefits of recoverably, recoverability from the failure of a single, single node, single piece. The failure of a single shard is recoverable because other shards have pieces of that data as well. That's the penultimate Project 5. It's a real world example. It's hard because it's a hard problem to solve. It's useful because it's a real world problem that people have spent tens of millions of dollars building, refining, and making better. Google uses Spanner, they also have their own internal uh, relational database, a SQL database, basically. And these things are provided both internally and externally. And if you build uh, Google applications using GCP, you will be using these services, whether you know it or not. So Spanner has this very interesting technology stack where they originally started with this thing called the Google File System probably my least favorite academic paper, although I've probably read it a dozen times and gone through it in gory details. Mostly the reason I don't like it is because I'm a file systems person and it's not a file system. They just called it the Google file system. Like, is that a file system? And the worst part was that basically they, they shocked the systems community, but of course the database people looked at this and said, we've been doing this for 30 years. That's another problem. File systems and databases actually are similar in, in many ways. The biggest difference is that databases, you have to tell them, well, uh, uh, like SQL databases, relational databases, you have to tell them the structure of your data. File systems, ah, eh, we don't care. Give us blobs. And that's why key value stores are very popular. They are, in essence, that blob style interface. They just don't have a hierarchical naming structure. If you actually look at a file system under the covers, it's a key value store with a hierarchical naming structure built on top of it. 
They replaced the Google file system with Colossus, and Colossus is, as far as I know, still what they use today. They have a versioned key value store called Bigtable. They have a, an object organizational model. They build on top of that using what they call tablets and directories. It's eerily similar to S3. The, the names are different to protect the, uh, the guilty, but um, the concepts are, much, are very similar. And then they have Megastore, which is the relational database. And all of these pieces are in use in GCP, even today. They implement a replicated state machine. You probably remember, vaguely remember talking about state machines at some point. Basically deterministic sets of rules that can be followed to move from state to state. Uh, state machines are really useful when we start trying to build transactional systems because we can actually reason about where things become consistent. So we can, we can designate that there's a set of states where things are consistent and the states in between are inconsistent. And then all we have to do is have some way of transitioning back to the cons consistent states. That's how you, if you want to get to the very abstract theoretical model of this, that's how you would think about that, or that's how I would think about it. They use two-phase locking for concurrency control because they need to make sure that any time there's an inconsistent state, it's not visible outside of the, the agents that are making the change. They use two-phase commit. Deal with transactional changes across replicas. So as we start moving across um, and we move data between shards, we move data to other data centers. We're going to do that with transactions so we can make sure that we either are both in the, well, we make sure that we're always, we always end up in the same state, whether it's the old state or the new state. We just don't end up in some in-between state where I've got the new data and you don't. <laughs> can you see a downside to this as... I've now introduced this whole geo-replication thing. I mean, I've talked about geo-replication geo before, but now we're actually here. Now we're trying to do it in transactions. We've already been talking about one of the problems, which was latency. What is the problem when I start doing things in geo-replication and I start doing them in this lockout model? How long do you have to wait to do your thing while he's doing his thing because he's got the, the two-phase lock? How long? Do you know? Nope, absolutely not. So that whole model of you know arbitrary reordering of operations and messages and whatnot and how things could take arbitrarily long, it's actually real. Maybe you sent your message first, but but and he said his second, but they got reordered and so his started. So your time to get your transaction done is going to depend on the time for his transaction to complete. If you really want to go down a, a rabbit hole. We're looking at queuing theory sometime. We live in a world full of queues. When you start really studying queuing theory and trying to reason about how long something is going to take in a queuing model, you begin to realize how horribly complicated things become very quickly. And of course, I'm putting this challenge out here because we are going to see models where we kind of cheat in order to avoid that extra latency, in order to prevent people from getting stuck in a queue where they don't know how long it's going to take to do something because they don't know how long it's going to take the, 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 the person in front of you. Ever gone to the, to the bank like in person and you actually get in the line and then the person in front of you like wants to do this really complicated transaction that takes like 20 minutes and you're standing there going, oh, put me out of my misery. All I wanted to do was deposit. Somebody sent me a check. Just want to put this check in. Who uses checks? Old people? The government? I have, I have an insurance company that I'm doing some work for, and they pay with a check. I'm like, who uses checks? And then, of course, it's a large enough check that I can't remote deposit it. Oh, we're sorry. That's above our limit. Great. 
Single machine consistency is actually pretty easy, as I said. Um, everybody is trying to write to the same database. We just block things while we're mut mutating the database. So we just serialize those things. And you know, a thousand friends post something. That's fine. We do it all one at a time. Let's make it more interesting. Let's mix this in with multiple data centers. So we've got multiple shards, multiple copies of things, multiple data centers, and we're posting to different servers. How the heck are we going to get any of this to serialize? Well, one model, and I already did kind of foreshadow this, you can relax your consistency model. So I have that whole ACID thing, right? Transactions, ACID. I've spent decades of my life figuring out different ways of building transactional systems where you, you kind of relax some of those things. You go, well, you know, I'm willing to live with, with a little less precision here in order to get like, you know, 400% increased performance. Do it fast or do it right. And while we like to think that we always want to do it right, the reality is that most people aren't actually willing to pay the price. When you save something to the disk on your computer, the operating system lies. It puts it in memory. Yeah, yeah, it'll get there eventually. Anybody here use a Windows machine? OK, so you can actually plug a USB stick in with um, NTFS or FAT on it, or EXFAT. Um, if it's NTFS, NTFS will cache things in memory. So if you yank the drive out before it's actually written the data out, it's just gone. That, on the other hand, aggressively flushes the data out to the, to the media in order to make sure that it gets to, uh, it gets to stable storage. So it, when you yank it out, the data is, is going to be there. That's the, the, this old model where you used to have to wait until the light went off on the, the attached media. Now, they don't even put lights on them anymore, so you just sort of guess. My favorite is, and, and I've done a lot of Windows file systems over there, my favorite is when you go down and you say, you know, you be polite and you say, safe to, you know, I want to eject this media, and it's, someone's using that right now. No, I don't think you understand. I was telling you I'm going to remove this media. I wasn't asking for your permission. Then I just yank it. Do you know how much actual code work goes into making sure that just yanking a piece of media out while I'm trying to write to it doesn't crash the system? So there's a lot of generality here, and there's a lot of places where we bend the rules because we want the performance rather than the correctness. But sometimes we want the correctness. Consistency is actually really important sometimes. I, I actually liked this example. So you decide that you're going to start applying for new jobs. So you want to take your, your boss off of your friends list. No offense, boss, but um, I'm taking you off my LinkedIn friends list. Does anybody have friends on LinkedIn? I mean, they're, I don't know what, I don't even, yeah, right, connections. I'm like, there's people on my, on my connections list that I was like, I have no idea who you are, but, because I don't really care. Um, you don't really want your boss to see the fact that you flipped on the, I'm looking for a new opportunity switch. So you kind of want that to be ordered. This is what we mean when we say something is serialized. I flip, I don't want the, the, the switch flip to get in front of the take boss off of connections list. So here's some, something where it's very important. The order in which we perform something is very important. A lot of times it doesn't really matter. If I add two connections, do I care which order they got in, added in? Probably not. I probably don't really care. So sometimes I care, sometimes I don't care. How do we achieve serializ serializability in a distributed system? So Google implemented true time, which sounds so much like a marketing term to me. Google implemented true time. And, and keep in mind, true time isn't absolute real time. Instead, what, what they said was true time is a window in which other things might have happened. So it's a bound. 
So those atomic clocks that we're using per data center give us timestamps that are pretty damn close, but not perfect. But we can measure what the level of imprecision is, and just simply to serialize something, we just simply delay the thing that needs to be serialized so it's outside of that window. Oh, so I can just simply serialize things by making you wait till tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's enough. Because Google's clocks are so precise, they can keep that window really small. And it's small enough that you're not probably not going to notice it. It's a couple of milliseconds. Now, they did this by using global positioning satellites. Global positioning satellites themselves actually have multiple atomic clocks on the satellite. What is an atomic clock? It uses an oscillator. I mean, ideally, you want to use cesium, right? Because the, the, the time standard is based on the number of... Actually, it's the, the time it takes for light to transit a certain distance in a vacuum is based on, an, is based on a specific number of vibrations of a particular cesium atom at a particular temperature. Got to be very precise here, right? That's literally how they define what a second is, how far light goes in this amount of... In, how long it takes light to go this far in this medium at this temperature as measured by a cesium atom's vibrations. That's your oscillator. That's the, the, the formal specification in um, SI. How many of you have a cesium atom vibrating in your watch or your phone? You might. You wouldn't even know, would you? <laughs> but no, we don't really have those. So we have these very precise clocks. And we can know that there was a small propagation delay. As long as we know what that propagation delay was, we get a timestamp. We know how long it takes us to hear, hear a time from that. We know that within two times that is our uncertainty window. So we just delay. We just hold the message until we know that it's been serialized. So when you're using true time in our transactional system, we grab our locks, we go get the, the time. So we ask for the time, we get the answer back, and then we just simply delay. So that gives us our two epsilon. Right? Because we waited one epsilon to get the to get the timestamp. We wait another epsilon. And then we can release our locks safely. Now we know that anything, anything that happened, uh, I have to push the right button. Anything that happened before we acquired that lock has finished. And now we've serialized this so that it will, it will always be observed by everyone who's playing in this sandbox. It will always be observed as happening after the events that were started before. We, we, we locked out and started ours. So when we start doing, um, doing this with our commits, we actually acquire the locks, and then we go get our time, and then we start our consensus protocol, and we get to our consensus. We wait a little bit longer. Let everything else settle out in the network, and then we can release our locks, and now we can proceed. So what we've done is we've said, we're in order to achieve serializability, we're just simply going to sit there and twiddle our thumbs for a little bit. Da, 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 da. OK, now we can go. That's it. Really simple idea. What's the problem here? Da, 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 da. I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs. I'm not doing any useful work. So there's a real cost associated with this. It does slow things down. But I get serializability. When I care about serializability, this is how I do it if I have really good clocks. This is also a pessimistic locking model. In optimistic locking models, which are what most people end up using because they're a huge win, um, 
you try to acquire locks when you need them, and if you can't acquire them, you just simply give up and try again. There are pros and cons to that approach. It makes it harder to reason about how long things take. In a pessimistic lock model, you're going to block until all the locks that you could possibly need in the whole world are acquired. In an optimistic lock model, you go, you know, I don't always need all those locks. And most of the time when I do need them, they're not a, they're, nobody else has them. And I've implemented these, and they, they make huge performance differences when you do optimistic locks, but they lead to weird tail, recur, uh, tail latency problems. And they're hard to reason about. It's very hard to reason about that, where you literally are sitting there grabbing, you, do some, you grab a lock, you do some work, you grab another lock, the other lock is going to require that um, you wait for it. And there may be times when it's not safe to wait for it because you've acquired the locks out of order, for instance, or, or, or so on and so forth. And so you have to drop that lock, and you have to undo the work that you did. Because remember, transactional consistency, undo that work that you did, and then go back. Or you grab a lock, you do a piece of work, you grab another lock, and now you have to validate that, the, the, that anything you read before this is another trick that we play. We read something before we have the lock that protects it. So we read something before the lock that we have that protects it. We make a decision that we, we hopefully will be the right decision. We then grab the lock. We then look at the value again to see if it's the right one. And if it is the right one, ha-ha, we win. Yay. It's like branch prediction. Boom. Big win. If we lose, it's like, oh. Now we have to undo everything. We have to roll backwards and try again. So that's the downside to optimistic locking. And it sounds like, well, why would you do it that way? And the answer is because it still ends up being a win. But it, it takes the complexity of the code that you write there and goes from, you know, about here and goes, oh, pretty close to the ceiling. They're very hard to debug. So much fun. It's a lot of fun when that code works right. And it's just crazy when it goes wrong because usually you're looking at um, the wreckage strewn through the system. I always think of myself as a particle physicist at that point. I don't actually get to see the particles. I just get to see the wreckage afterwards and try to project backwards to figure out what probably caused it. Those are race conditions on steroids. So we can combine two-phase commit with commit wait. Same, same basic idea. We get our locks. Now we're getting into cross processes. Um, we have to get our timestamps. Everybody has to wait for their timestamps to to expire, so we wait for our, our, our uh, epsilon window, and then we release our locks, and then we notify everybody that the life, you know, actually, I'm sorry, we notify everybody, then we release our locks and we're done and we move forward with our lives. And that means that a multi-node transaction has in fact been properly serialized. So let's look at our example of the risky post. So we've got, um, we, we, we need to serialize this, right? Because we want to remove that person from our friends list before we do that post. And so we, we introduce this timestamp window trick. We remove, we wait for our propagation delay, then we actually commit that change. Now we go and we add that post. So effectively, what we've done is we've said, you have to wait until I know that I can guarantee what I'm about to tell you is done, actually is done. That's it. It's like waiting until the disk drive light goes out on your USB stick before you yank it out. Same basic idea. What do you lose? You lose time. What do you gain? You gain serializability. You gain the, the, the fact that your boss isn't going to see that you're now looking for a new job. Um, another technique that we can use is to use timestamps as a version. So what happens is we read a value, we get a timestamp along with the, the value that we read. It's a version number, a timestamp, a sequence number. It, it doesn't have to be an actual timestamp. Of course, if you've got a really nice, precise clock like Google does, woohoo! yeah, you can use that. If you're sitting here in some you know, normal world where you can't afford a half million dollar GPS atomic clock system, then you're probably going to use something like G, uh, monotonically increasing value, which is just a different name for a sequence number. 
The nice thing about this is you don't actually have to have a distributed cut because if you're using a timestamp, an actual timestamp, like a Google timestamp, then you can use that. Uh, you can actually use vector clocks as well to implement this. But of course, in that case, you might need a, uh, consistent cuts. Your time isn't required. So they have a very short window there, about five to seven milliseconds according to the paper. They've probably improved it since then, but still five to seven milliseconds isn't a long time to wait. When you get into the NTP windows and you talk about 100 milliseconds, and that starts to become uh, on the threshold of visible to humans. 250 milliseconds is usually where humans will notice things. So what do we do? Do we wait for this longer window? Do we sacrifice our external consistency? Or do we try to enforce external consistency only when we need it? This is one of the things that makes this hard. Because the answer is going to be, it depends upon what you need for the particular use case. In a lot of cases, you don't need strict serializability. You don't need to have external consistency. Amazon figured that out with shopping carts. They don't actually take things out of inventory when you put it in your cart. They used to, and they found it was too expensive. They said, you know what? We'll reconcile it at the time you try to buy it. And that's why things can go wrong. And sometimes even that goes wrong, and they, they realize afterwards, oh, crap, we screwed up, and we've sold too many of these things, at which point they will refund it. And it's easier for them to fix it after the fact. But they no longer have strict serializability and strong external consistency. So there are real world cases where we give up these nice features in exchange for much better performance. Uh, CockroachDB, I put the link in the slides. You can actually go look at CockroachDB. I, I actually linked to the GitHub. There's a company called CockroachDB.com that, gosh, uses CockroachDB, the open source version, as a commercial product. Uh, is a Database that offers both eventual and external consistency. Eventual consistency is kind of this joke where people say eventually consistent means never consistent. Eventually, in, at the, you know, as we approach infinity and beyond, it will become consistent. It's a sloppier view of the world, but it's pretty much good enough in most cases. If you're using eventual consistency, what you're probably going to end up with is like the, the friend I was telling you about who has to sit there and monitor queues and deal with things that go wrong because sometimes it's not going to be consistent enough and someone's going to have to actually fix it. But it may be cheaper for you to do that. This is the, the common case versus the uncommon case trade-off. Snapshot isolation is another approach to this where we can use um, optimistic concurrency control, uh, it requires both atomicity and isolation, but gives up, um, um, let's see, why am I drawing a blank? I always do this. Atomic, consistent. We give up consistency, and we give up durability. So sometimes things could roll back. Amazon's S3 is actually not, um, not consistent or durable it actually will roll backwards depending upon which replica you read from. And you can build systems, people do build systems on this that work just fine, but you have to be aware of their consistency model and their consistency guarantees. Uh, we have multi-version concurrency control, which means that we, instead of keeping one value, we keep multiple values with timestamps on them. So I can uh, look at what the value was at a particular time. Think of AMO. AMO is essentially like a really cheap way of doing that. I give you the answer I gave you yesterday because that's the answer that I gave you yesterday. And I only compute that answer once. But there's a correctness guarantee here because um, we can read from our versioned snapshots. So we can make correct decisions based upon the, the based upon the version that we're, we're using. Um, and our sequence of snapshots is actually serializable because there's actually no cycles in there. There's, there we, because we're making consistent cuts. So we can reason about these things. Uh, I'm basically at the end of time, so I will finish. I'll, I'll record the last little bit of this and put it up. Um,
later. But the takeaway from this is we can build distributed transactions. They're just way more complicated than single node transactions. It's the same basic idea. We want the same benefits, but we're going to pay a much higher price for these. And we're going to have to consider ways in which we can achieve our goals without sacrificing our performance. This is don't focus on making the uncommon case fast and the common case slow. You almost always want to make the common case fast, which is things aren't going wrong. And the uncommon case slower. That's almost always, almost always a win. And sometimes it's okay for us to compromise on our guarantees. Again, this is one of the reasons that distributed systems end up being much more complex. You sit down, you write an application, the application works, it doesn't work. You don't have the, well, you know, it kind of works here, but not there, and I'm you know, only going to give you some guarantees. No. no. <laughs> In our systems? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are people who be offering all sorts of different versions and variants of this, and, and people will use them because it will fit their particular need. So um, I'm going to call it there, and I will, will record that, and then I'll post a link to the, the recording. I usually stream it when I record it, too. So if you're like, obviously, the people in this room probably aren't doing this, but there are people back watching this on Twitch. Um, you, you can see the stream pop up, and you can actually watch when I record it. All right. Thanks, and I'll see you next Tuesday.